Into the great wide open, into the sky so blue, into the great wide open, a rebel without a clue. Greetings, my brothers and sisters, grace and peace to you. My name is Pastor Bob, and I get to be, I get to be, I get to be one of the pastors here at Mount Tabor United Methodist Church. Thanks, as always, for the blessing of worshiping our Lord alongside you. I hope it's a blessing for you, too. And that's just it. Is it a blessing? Mahatma Gandhi said that when I admire the wonders of a sunset or the beauty of the moon, my soul expands in the worship of the Creator. G.K. Chesterton said that when we really worship anything, we love not only its clearness, but its obscurity. We exult in its very invisibility. Are we exulting in even the invisibility? Are our souls expanding? Last Wednesday, we moved the Ignite service outdoors so we could gather once more and worship. But I wonder if we exulted and expanded or were, or were we just glad to get out of the house? Was it worship? What about right now? Are we ready to worship? Or are we just going through the motions, just doing that which we have always done? Because that's what we've always done. I want you to know something right here and right now. If your answer is yes, hooray. But if your answer is I'm not sure, cool. If your answer is no, that's cool too. What I appreciate in any of the answers is the candor in which they are given. For in that candor, we are all okay to admit that sometimes it just ain't happening. The bus has left the station. My get up and go has gotten up and left. Turn out the lights. The party's over. Sometimes an area of our lives, and particularly our Christian lives, can cool off. Maybe our generosity has grown cold or our passion to serve has gone away. Maybe we've become cynical and lost the selfless love and concern for others. When we were members of Main Street United Methodist Church in Reedsville, Susan and I, or Susan attended a women's Bible study led by Beth Moore a greatly popular leader of a great many studies who's been doing so for as long as I can remember. I happened to be at the church for another matter when Susan was engaged in her gathering one evening and I peeked my head in the classroom to say hello and was afforded the chance to actually see what all the fuss was about to see Beth for the first time. What I noticed was not her Texas drawl, though it was charming. What I noticed was not her hair, though it was about as tall as I am. What I noticed was her eyes, for they seemed, at least in the brief clip that I viewed, to never blink. A few years later, I saw Beth in person at one of her live events, and since I was sitting close and was also one of about, well, 12 guys in an arena of about 15,000 women, at one point, she looked right at me, and her eyes once more, once more never seemed to blink. Now, it wasn't one of those creepy Hannibal Lecter, hello, Clarice moments. Beth looked wide-eyed and blinkless because it was as if she did not w wish to miss anything. She wanted to take everything in, the people she was with and the word they were all engaging. She wanted to take everything in. She didn't want to miss a thing. I want to have a faith that is alive and vibrant and expectant. I want to have a contagious, and in this case I'm okay saying contagious, spiritual fervor that also lifts the faith of others. I want to have a passionate prayer life that fuels my spiritual fervor and also influences others. He has been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism is what we read in Acts 18.25. Spiritual fervor comes from sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning his ways. The Holy Spirit will instruct and convey God's love to us. As we engage with our Lord through the Holy Scriptures and through prayer, the Spirit will ignite our hearts with God's truth. And as Paul wrote in his second letter to the church at Corinth, verses 15 and 16 of the second chapter, 
Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are life-giving perfume. While we're on the subject of scripture, the verse on which we're focusing specifically today comes from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, verses 11 and 12 of the 12th chapter. Hear these words from the New Living Translation. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient and in trouble and keep on praying. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. According to Tim Mackey of the Bible Project, the book of Romans is Paul's longest and most significant volume penned by the apostle formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, a Jewish rabbi who was part of a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees. He was a passionate defender of the Torah and Israel's traditions. He was a virulent antagonist of the followers of Jesus, whom he saw as a threat to order. But then he had a run-in with the risen Jesus who introduces him to his new job description. This old rabid persecutor of Christians will become their most prolific and potent teacher, leader, voice, and conscience. With this charge, Paul, having been knocked off his high horse by Jesus, gets back in the saddle for Jesus, traveling all around the Roman Empire, telling all he encounters about the Lord he had encountered forming these new followers into communities of churches to whom he would often write letters, words of affirmation and admonition, words of cajoling and conviction, words of sympathy and censure, all depending on the circumstance. The book of Romans was actually written pretty late in Paul's life to a community long established and comprised of Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. An emperor named Claudius boots out all the Jews, but five years later they return to a church that is fractured along any number of lines. So Paul writes this letter mostly to get them to get along. He thought the church at Rome could be the assembly that would give rise to churches all the way to Spain. In the introduction to the book of Romans in his Bible translation known as the Message, Eugene Peterson calls Paul's words exuberant and passionate thinking. This is the glorious life of the mind enlisted in the service of God. Paul takes the well-witnessed and devoutly believed facts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth and thinks through its implications. How does it happen that in the death and resurrection of Jesus, world history took on a new direction? And at the same moment, the life of every man, woman, and child on the planet was eternally affected. What is God up to? What does it mean that Jesus saves? What's behind all this? And where is it going? These are the questions that drive Paul's thinking. He takes logic, poetry, and imagination, scripture and prayer, creation and history and experience, and weaves them into this letter that has become the premier document of Christian theology." End of quote. Okay, but that's the big picture matter, and that's all well and good, but what about right here and right now, rubber meets the road stuff? Up to chapter 12, Paul has talked about beliefs, the sinfulness of mankind, the forgiveness of that sinfulness through Christ Jesus, the freedom from sin's talons, and then a chronicling of Israel's past, present, and future. That's been the tenor of chapters 1 through 11, and 12 through 16 will speak of how to behave. It's about his will and not mine. It's about his thinking and not mine. It's about his life and not mine. I par I'm part of a body of believers belonging one to the other, serving one another by employing the gifts given me, but intended for others. I'm to devote myself to the other, and the only difference between us comes from the look of my eye, not the Father's. In the Father's eyes, we are all one, and we're all his kids. I'm, 
I'm getting pumped up here. And that's the really cool thing. Paul wrote this letter 2,000 years ago, and I think he could sense the zeal that would be his readers, including me. So he tells the church at Rome and the church on Robin Hood to hold on to that zeal, hold on to that passion, hold on to that fervor. Keep your eyes wide open. There's so much to see here. You're not even going to want to blink. But what about Christian lives that have cooled off and generosity that has grown cold and passion to serve that has gone away? What about becoming cynical and losing a selfless love and concern for others? Seems to me Paul hasn't seen the news lately. Of the many acronyms employed in the pursuit of recovery, one is known as H-A-L-T, or HALT, and the letters denote the dangers to one's sobriety if one gets too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I think we are in a world of HALT. We're hungry for relief, angry at our circumstance, lonely in our distance, social or otherwise, and tired of not knowing when this will all end. But we need not be hungry if we've the bread of life. We need not be angry if we've his joy. We need not be lonely if he is with us forever, even to the ends of the age. And we need not be tired if his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We need not be. A few years ago, Sting was feted at the Kennedy Center Honors. And one of the performers to pay tribute was, and I know you'll be astonished that I am citing him, was Bruce Springsteen. The boss came out and did a song of Sting's called I Hung My Head, and not surprisingly, the boss brought it. I mean, he brought it. At performance's end, the camera panned to Sting, and he stood and applauded raucously, stomping his feet and shaking his fists in fervor. But what really got me was the reaction of Sting's wife sitting directly behind him. You see her wide-eyed and overwhelmed, and all she can utter is, wow, wow. I'm pretty sure she never blinked. That's the fervor to which call, Paul called the church at Rome, the fervor to which he calls the church on Robin Hood. That's the passion to which we are called in recognition of and devotion to the one whose story of life, death, and resurrection propelled world history into a new direction and at the same moment eternally affected the life of every man, woman, and child on the planet. It's a world that's hungry, angry, lonely, and tired with eyes that are sullen and weary, but we get to meet that gaze with wide-eyed wonder, zeal, and fervor, eyes of devotion, understanding, compassion and love, the eyes that are the windows into the heart and soul of Jesus, eyes that never blink because they are the eyes that don't want to miss a thing. We get to. Are we ready? What are we going to do about it? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for its many blessings. Thank you for giving us eyes to see. Forgive us the times when we're blinking and hungry and angry and lonely and tired and let us just open our eyes. Let us not blink our eyes. Let us want 